Shall we have an early start? Yes. Okay. Yep. But, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I reopened the hearing on what was originally day 10, but it has now become day 9. Um, as usual, I'll ask uh, the question whether any procedural, administrative, or household questions. Good Person morning, Mr. Chairman. Not from the claimant side. No. From the respondent side, there was one open issue that uh, Mr. Hub wanted to inquire if there was a copy of the blog that was um, deleted. Mm. Uh, you remember the Vattenfall blog? Yeah. Yes, there is a copy, apparently. Excellent. Could we get that so we can still use it in our closing presentations? Yeah, will it? We will print it out then in the first break. Maybe electronically would be faster. Dr. Conrad, are you then making an application to use this document as yet in the proceedings? Yes, we were planning to use, because uh, uh, claimants hadn't come back to us, with my uh, reading out of the blog during the procedural application from the transcript. We were just going to use it uh, for illustrative purposes, if that's possible. Um, and in that sense, I'm making the application. But the content of the blog is already in the record. Yeah, but this is a 13.3 uh, PO1 uh, application, if I may use yes. all the, sh the short uh, cuts. Um, any objection, Professor Robert, for, from the claimants? No objection. Okay. Document admitted. Right. Um, Professor Robert, please uh, start with the closing Thank uh, statement. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the tribunal. Um, you are about to hear the Vattenfall Quartet again. We are dividing the presentation between the four of us. You have uh, in the closing bundle a table of contents, and we will follow that, uh, of course, starting with introduction and then going on with jurisdictions, on and so forth. Uh, during our opening statement, I discussed three issues which are not part of this case. First, it is not about the use of nuclear energy. Secondly, uh, it is not about Germany's right to regulate. As we have said, we accept that right. But Germany, as any other state, must be held responsible under international law, customer international law, and in our case, under the ECT, for the consequences of its decisions. Thirdly, this case is not about the safety of nuclear energy in Germany. Germany has admitted in this arbitration that its decision to accelerate the phase-out was, was not based on concerns over safety of the German MPPs, nuclear power plants. It was based and solely based on an allegedly changed perception of the risk that nuclear energy poses to the German population. That is not a valid justification under international law. Germany accepts that the Fukushima accident was a, quote, beyond design event. And, of quote, this is day one, transcript, page 196. <coughs> Uh, line six to seven. If Fukushima was a, a beyond design event, and this was the cause of the change in perception that led to the moratorium in the 13th Amendment, then there is no need at all to discuss design. Thus, Germany's inflammatory descriptions of fires, quote unquote, and pictures of corroded barrels, quote unquote, this is again from, from the opening statement, or its calling of numerous technical witnesses and experts contribute nothing to the ultimate determination as to whether in 2011 Germany had the right to enact certain laws in the way it did without paying compensation for the consequences of such legislation. So why did we even discuss safety concerns over the past two weeks? Because Germany has tried to convolute these proceedings with highly technical discussions of safety and nuclear energy jargon to justify its attempt, ex post, 
to accelerate the nuclear phase out by enacting the moratorium and the 13th Amendment. Germany argues solely in hindsight to craft a new subjective reality in 2011, whereby the moratorium and the 13th Amendment would be legitimized due to the alleged safety risks, quote unquote, posed by the plants. However, in doing so, Germany is effectively trying to turn this arbitration into safety review proceeding of the criminal plant under German law. This is not the time or place to discuss those issues. Indeed, there is no need. As I said, this case is not about safety. The only reason why claimants entertain this issue is to discuss the quantum of its damages, i.e. to answer questions as to when our financial experts can assume that criminal would restart and to analyze the costs each nuclear power plant faces during the decommissioning phase. We therefore ask the tribunal to assess all evidence related to the technical nature and safety of the plants, primarily through this limited lens. When we peel off all the draws, the bottom line legal issue remains the one identified on day one, namely, does a mere alleged change of perception or risk entitle the state to shut down individual installations which comply with existing laws and regulations, to change rules and regulations on which investors had relied to invest hundreds of millions of euros, to deprive their assets of any value, and to do all of this without compensation? As I said during the opening statement, the answer is obviously no. There are several examples throughout our history of governments having nationalized entire sectors of the economy, mostly in the energy <coughs> sector. Examples include Mexico in the 1930s, Iran in the 1950s, Libya, and Iran again in the 1970s. Most foreign investors in these situations have received compensation. Likewise, when the Swedish government decided to shut down one of the nuclear power plants in Sweden, the Wasserbeck plant, it paid compensation to E.ON, the operator of that plant. And that is what also the German government must do, i.e. pay compensation to the claimants. Uh, I now hand over, to, hand over to Dr. Hupp, please. Thank you, Professor Hubert. Members of the tribunal, I will start with the issues on jurisdiction. Um, let me, okay. Now it works. <clears throat> Let me come to the first point. You've heard during the last two weeks repeated assertions as to Aeon being the sixth claimant in this arbitration. That is flatly incorrect. If you look around, Aeon is not sitting in this room. It's not claimant <coughs> in this arbitration. It hasn't filed the request for arbitration. It will not be the creditor of any award which you might render. Aeon's claims in the Constitutional Court proceedings, to which respondent has referred, do not meet the triple identity test of lispendence. It's between different parties. It's a different object, the annulment of the law, and a different legal basis. They have no relevance for these proceedings, and as it is established, in arbitral jurisprudence, custom, any risk of a double recovery, which we consider at the moment to be speculative, will be dealt with always by the later, by the second tribunal or the second court. If the first court or tribunal also deals with it, there's the clear risk that both courts defer to each other and say, oh, well, we're not going to award any damages because there might be double recovery. And at the end, then there is none because there is no binding effect. So Aeon is not here. And Aeon doesn't play a legal role. There's then the complementary point, something which we found deeply disturbing in respondents' argumentation. They have continuously referred to the claimants KKK, OHG, and KKB, OHG, <coughs> as a kind of sham entity. As, a kind, as it is kind of a front shop which just exists in order to forward profits to a child. And we think it's necessary to point out some very essential facts. 
The first is the companies are organized under German law. The second is they're registered in the commercial registries. The third one, which respondent tries to sneak around, is OHGs, auto partnerships, and not juridical persons under German law, are legal entities. They can sue and be sued. They can conclude contracts. You have on the file the development fund agreement. And they can enter into settlement, which I think respondent itself <coughs> has submitted into the record as exhibit R0281, if I'm not mistaken. They are owners of the plants. They are holders of the operating licenses. And they are the holders of the OEPV and NEPV, which were assigned to them by law. What respondent essentially tries to convey to you is the impression that Germany assigns nuclear licenses to mailbox companies. This is, with all due respect, completely ridiculous. This is a fully functioning operating legal entity which is reliable under nuclear law, which has been tested for reliability under nuclear law, and it is not a mailbox company. Any, even the slightest accusation of respect is completely ridiculous. There's one further aspect which we ask you to take into account, which is a legal one, as you can deduce from the excerpts from the commercial registries. Both OHGs initially were GmbHs. A GmbH is a company <coughs> with limited liability, and it is a juridical person. They transformed by and keeping their identity in doing so in 2003, and at that time, Vattenfall already owned and controlled HEW and therefore also the power plant companies and what once is an investment will keep to be investment that is in the Energy Charter Treaty. The next point, just for the sake of our, yep. I ask a question here on this point. Your last bullet point on slide five, which you just presented, was that there were uh, G GmbH, and you write an I, E, juridical persons until 2003 before transforming into OAGs. And OAG is not a juridical person? Well, we need to differentiate first what we are to define what we understand under the term juridical person. The term juridical person is used in the exit convention yeah. is completely different. Under German law, you differentiate between juridical persons and non-juridical persons. Juridical persons come into existence under German law by entering them into the commercial register and by a and by and sovereign act, while non-juridical persons come into existence by the party's agreement. In practice, however, there's little difference between non-juridical persons and juridical persons because OHGs, or they're more often used complementary, the so-called Kommanditgesellschaft, they mm -hmm are legal entities and they are, well, the German term is rechtsfähig, which means they sue and can be sued. They conclude contracts all in their own name. So the difference <coughs> in practice is mm -hmm. academic. Does that answer your question, Mr. President? Yeah, but the point is, is as you rightly pointed out, uh, the exit convention uses the word juridical persons. Yes. Um, so we have to distinguish here that, an, or do we have to assume here that what you say is a non juridical person is a juridical person for the purposes of the exit convention? Yes, that is why I was referring on this slide to the statement by Professor Schreuer, who <laughs> clearly <laughs> testified so during his expert, uh, during the cross examination when asked by Dr. Conrad, where he said, under German law, I understand is not incorporated and therefore not a juridical person. However, I also understand that it has the right to sue and be sued and the right to enter into commitments like contracts. And I think from the perspective of the exit convention, those latter characteristics count and not any un definition under German law. I might also wish to point out that a respondent, while having raised multiple jurisdictional objections, to my knowledge, has not objected to the OHGs being juridical persons within the sense of the exit convention. They are juridical persons. The term juridical person and the exit convention has to be interpreted autonomously and independent from national law. <coughs> this is, if you allow me, a word completely different from 
there was one case against Pakistan, I think, where in completely unincorporated joint ventures, you'd, I've forgotten the name of the claim, of the claimant now, but that was just a mere contractual agreement which didn't even have under Swiss law rights to appear as such where the company which was claimant, in pre was it in Predilo? I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I need to remember, was, uh, was just the contractual leader of the joint venture, but the joint venture had even, didn't even have the right to enter into contracts on it in its own name. And so, to be sure. so we have here a completely different case. To be clear, uh, under the ECT, the definition of an investor, that refers to organizations. And is it your case that, therefore, the question of juridical personality is not an issue for the purposes of the ECT as opposed to the exit convention? Um, that is basically correct. Thank you for the question, Professor Lowe. That is why we referred on this slide and the first bullet point to the definition of the investor under the ECT, companies organized under the law of a contracting state. They fulfill that requirement, they have the right to sue and be sued, and they instituted these exit proceedings without having met objections as to their capacity as such. Therefore, we say uh, they are juridical persons under the exit convention. It hasn't been put into doubt until now. We mentioned it just for the sake of the argument as a matter of precaution because the respondent repeatedly used this term. May I proceed, Mr. President? Thank you. So, Professor Schroyer testified <coughs> that the OHGs, in his view, considered juridical persons within the sense of the exit convention. Now let's come for purposes of discussing jurisdiction to what, has the, what seems to be the contested element, what we've discussed during the last two weeks, the issue of the non-Swedish companies, not Vattenfall AB. It is, I think there will be no doubt, an investor of another contracting party. There should, in our view, also be no doubt that Vattenfall AB controls its 100% owned subsidiaries, that is Vattenfall GmbH and Vattenfall Nuclear. Respondent has raised certain arguments in its opening statement regarding the domination agreement. I think we have covered that in our opening statement. If you have questions regarding that, I'm happy to answer. But I proceed on the assumption that at least control over Vattenfall GmbH and Vattenfall Nuclear is undisputed. We also believe that control over KKB OHG, which is owned to 76.5%, should be undisputed. If it's not, I'm sure my colleague, Dr. Conrad, will mention that. In, the uh, in her statement, we at least haven't discussed this during the last two weeks. The discussion focused nearly exclusively on KKK OHG, and in order not to waste your time, I'd like to concentrate on KKK. What we know is that Vattenfall Nuclear is the managing director and holds 50%. And it's the managing director not by way of election that the parties ad hoc had elected them to be managing shareholder. It is directly in the articles of association and thus cannot be changed unilaterally by one of the parties. You've heard the testimony of Professor Schroyer, who reviewed from the perspective of international law the facts, and who concluded that, <coughs> found at the end of the transcript, that the combination of a 50% shareholding plus management an aggregate would amount to control within the meaning of the Energy Charter Treaty. We also would like to point out that Vattenfall Nuclear became involved into the reliability proceedings, which have so extensively been discussed, because of its control and influence over KKK. It was not E.ON. The reliability proceedings concentrated on Vattenfall Nuclear, which was the managing director precisely for that. So, respondent cannot have it both ways. Either there is control, and that is why it was included, or there isn't. Now, let's speak about the interesting legal issues. Who are the investors, and what are the investments? And then I'd like to discuss why the four 
German companies are considered to be investors of another contracting party for the purposes of this arbitration. The definition of investor and the Energy Charter Treaty is <coughs> rather unique. It does not refer to a specific nationality. It simply says it must be, as regards a company, a company organization organized in accordance with the law applicable in that contracting party. Thus, since also the four German companies are organized in accordance with the law applicable in Germany, if you take strictly the definition of investor, all five claimants are investors. The Energy Charter Treaty uses the difference in nationality only when you go into the substantive protection and when you go into the dispute settlement. Then it adds, it must be an investor of another contracting party. But as a starting point, they are investors. What are now the investments? Again, the Energy Charter Treaty definition is very wide and nearly all-encompassing. It's every kind of asset owned or controlled directly or indirectly. And that, I believe, has given ri is, um, rise to your question, Mr. President, at the beginning in the opening statement. Uh, if you look at the chain of companies with the Vattenfall AB at the top and the power plant operating companies in the bottom and their assets, um, it gets a bit complicated as long as you consider the power plant companies KKK, OHG, and KKB, OHG, oh, to be controlled. There's a direct chain, Vattenfall AB owns and controls directly everything on the level directly below it and indirectly owns and control all the other levels. And it, the more you go down, the less is held what Vattenfall GmbH, as the German holding company, directly owns and controls Vattenfall Nuclear and indirectly owns and controls what's in the power plant companies. Um, I have prepared two more slides to which I'll come in a minute which will show you this. And I admit that the complexity of the different viewpoints which you can take depending on whether you accept control at a certain level or not makes this rather complicated. But we hope that the slides we have developed can make it easier for you. So let's briefly talk about the electricity, electricity production volumes. Respondent has denied that they are right. Well, we think they are. You have heard the, uh, you have seen the report by Professor Arndt. The basic facts are, I think, undisputed. The electricity production volumes are assigned by law directly to the individual power plants as a substitute for the formerly unlimited production license. You'll find this in Exhibit C0018, that is the draft of the lifetime extension. On page 10, you see the table where the volumes are directly assigned. We have shown to you during the cross-examination of Professor Papier that the volumes can and in practice were transferred and sold for considerable amounts of money, and the parties considered them to be rights, and even respondents' quantum expert assigns value to them. So they are at least, in any case, assets. They are sold, they have value, and thus they are investments, and as my colleagues will explain, what is an asset can be taken away. What about now the NEPV, the new electricity production vol volumes? We first would like to dispel two objections which were raised by respondent. The first is they are not an ephemeral windfall. An ephemeral windfall is something of a chance which comes lucky, which is unexpected. What they are is the negotiated restitution of what has been taken away in 2002 without compensation. It's very simple. The claimants initially had unlimited licenses. This was <coughs> limited by way of a kind of, a, an, of an agreement in 2002, and then by way of another agreement in 2010, something was given back to them of which what they already had. There are also no hopes or chances, as respondent writes in its memorials, and in its briefs, they are specifically negotiated and assigned. I would like to refer you to avoid repetition 
to my opening statement on day one from pages 65 to 67, where I referred you to the witness statement of Dr. Portugal, where he describes the negotiations and makes clear that the operators wanted legal certainty, which the state initially didn't want to give, that they then said that we have no deal. Professor Lowe? Sorry. Can I just jump in? It, it's a, a clarification question. You said that they were uh, negotiated compensation for taking away an originally unlimited right. Uh, unlimited in the sense that uh, operating under the uh, atom concepts, there would have been a non-time-limited right to produce the OEPV. That is correct. Um, and just to be precise, I think there were restitution of what has been taken away without compensation, but you're entirely correct. Under the original Atomic Energy Act, there was no temporal time limitation. Mm -hmm. There's still no temporal time limitation, but in 2002, there was an operating limitation included first into the agreement and then into the law by way of the electricity production volumes. Yeah, but to be clear, it, it was not an unlimited right to produce in the sense that there were no limitations upon the right to produce electricity because by the time this happened, we were operating with the OEPV. Um, yes, well. yes. Thanks. My argument, perhaps, if it wasn't entirely clear, is that the state gave back to the investors by way of an agreement of what they originally had when they built the plants and when they obtained their first license. We think, uh, members of the tribunal, that when respondent attacks the N character of the NEPV as investments and says that nothing has been spent in reliance on them, that respondent confuses the, the economic process of making an investment with the legal term of owning or controlling an investment. The Energy Charter Treaty says that someone must own or control an investment. It does not say that you initially have to make the investment. I can buy an investment, and then my investment is not the money which I spend, but what I hold. If I buy a company, the company is my investment and not the money which I invested into the company. We think that making further investments or spending further money in reliance on existing investments is not a condition for expropriation of existing investments. I have, however, understanding that Germany argues that because under German constitutional law, it's a bit different. So what are now the investments of the individual claimants? Um, if you wish, I'll direct you through those two tables, but this will take some time. I'd rather I've structured them in two different ways, one in form of a table, and here you see it in blue in the left column in black, the investors, and right in the, the various individual investments. We hope this gives you more clarity and avoids confusion. It is due to the wide formulation of indirectly owned and controlled a bit complicated. So now let's speak about Article 26.7, which is, I think, the most interesting part of the jurisdictional section and which is so in dispute between the parties. Which claimants are investors of another contracting party? Yes? Before we continue about investors, I'm still about the investments. The table 14 is somewhat different from what um, Mr. Kasmerik has shown us in figure one. Remember that at page 19 of his report? And if I show it to you here, then you may visually, visually recall this. Yes. It's the yellow boxes. And, and, he, and he says in his report, I don't know whether he's He's qualified to, 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 to state it, but anyway, he says these yellow boxes are the investments. That's the, that's it. So, but you were saying you, we have to see this differently depending from who you look to look this? Well, that what you have in your hand, Mr. Chairman, is the base case on which we have submitted to you that are the investments which are dispute, which are directly affected, the investments, the, uh, the power plants and the assets. But respondent has launched multiple objections against the character of the German companies as being investors. So, and also against the level of control. So if, for example, you were to find that Vattenfall AB doesn't exercise control about Kreml, then Kreml is not an investor. And then we speak only about indirectly owned 
and controlled investments, that is the assets of the companies. If you also say that Vattenfall Nuclear is not an investor, because you say that under 26.7 this does not work, then you move up the chain. So depending on what you consider to be an eligible investor, the investments are different. If, for example, you were to conclude that only Vattenfall AB is a suitable investor, then everything else below Vattenfall AB are investments either directly or indirectly owned or controlled. What Mr. Katzmerich pointed out is the basic case which we assume, on which we've based our argumentation, they're all, even the power plant operating companies KKK and KKB OHG are investors within the meaning of the Energy Charter Treaty and they hold investments which have been affected by those measures. But that, that raises for me, if I, if I may, your uh, the relief sought in this case. Um, if you bear me one second and I give you the, uh, the reference. If <coughs> so if you go to your relief sought, I think and that is in your memorial. <coughs> no, it's the reply. Good, yeah. All right, if you go to, go to your reply memorial to page 241, 241. And the reason why I ask it here is because the, you have seek relief in the alternative depending on what the tribunal would accept as being the investment. Can I breathe? Sure. Yes, we, we have it. You have it? All right, so in paragraph 760, yeah. you have your prayer for relief. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was that is the latest prayer for relief as stated by the claimants mm -hmm. in this case. All right, so A, we leave out for the time being for this discussion, but B, because A, B, A simply for completeness sake, uh, is about to declare that, that Germany has breached its obligations towards the claimants under Part 3 of the Energy Charter Treaty. Mm -hmm. But then B says, order Germany to pay, together with interest thereon, yeah. corresponding to LIBOR plus 4%, as from 14 March 2011, until the date of full payment. Mm -hmm. One. And then you get the primary request, and that assumes that all five are claimants. Remember that we have identified as claimant number one, two, three, four, and five. Correct? Yes, that is correct. Then, in two, little two, that is in the alternative, that is if claimant five would not be accepted as an investor. Correct? Correct. In that case, we assume that under 2A, still that Brunsbüttel OHG is a suitable investor, and that... Um, Vattenfall Nuclear can only claim damages respective to its percentage of its shareholding into KKK. Yeah. Then, and then three is if claimants four and five are not investors. Correct? Yes. But now you get any four is when claimants three to five are not an investor. That is correct. The and five to be complete, that is when claimants two to five are not an investor. That's correct. Now, the question I have is about this. Has respondent disputed, actually, that three, the, sorry, that two and three are not an investor? They do is dispute four, uh, four or five. That's, that's clear. Mr. President, that was our understanding, but the respondent is free to confirm and say that it has no objections. In that case, those alternative requests automatically become moot. Yeah, may, may I will allow, because normally it's only one side. 
Somebody uh, to clear up this point. We have pointed out that claimants failed to prove control, even though they're 100% owned, because they dissolved the and purposefully dissolved the control agreements. And a control agreement is just a control agreement. That so is what it says. So Dr. Dr. Komat, you're talking about now about two and three, or three, four, and five? <laughs> I'm talking about the 100% owned Vattenfall subsidiaries, which are immediately underneath Vattenfall AB. That's two and, f uh, two and, and, and three. Exactly. And you, and you are, there, there you're disputing it on, on, on the control. Exactly, issue. the uh, control agreement. Yeah. Four and five. Wunsbüttel and Krümmel we have very vociferously uh, disputed, including Wunsbüttel, contrary to what claimants told you just okay. now. Right. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. But now we come to the issue now you go to address is four or five, basically. Yes, we think that respondents' arguments with respect to two and three have, well, we wouldn't even discuss it further. The so-called control agreement, which is under German law not a control, but a domination agreement, um, has been dissolved, but we have explained why this has no relevance for the control under international law, and we wanted to focus on that, what we consider to be most important and disputed. Okay. Now, um, I would like to invite the, the respondent to come back on, on the two and three control issue in your closing statement, simply to clear the, clear clarify it for us. Thank you. So that being said, we, uh, we are now on, on the 26-7 issue, that's, and that mainly is that uh, four or five. Just a question. The domination uh, agreements were um, revoked or dissolved before or after consent was given by you? After the registration of the request. That's what I thought. Thank you very much. So I will then proceed with Article 26.7. It is our view, members of the tribunal, that Article 26.7, contrary to what respondent says, is an all-encompassing agreement on nationality of investors in case of exit proceedings. We think that respondent's interpretation is unreasonable within the sense of the Vienna Convention, if not even manifestly absurd. We believe this for three main reasons. The first is, and we base this on the interpretation in accordance with the Vienna Convention. We say firstly that the wording makes clear the will of the parties that locally incorporated companies should be able to file claims. We say second that the context in which Article 26.7 is situated, and that is the whole Article 26.7 makes clear that the agreement relates also to nationality under the ECT. And we say, thirdly, that this result is fully compatible with the object and purpose of the Energy Charter Treaty, which is to create a special and unique regime for energy investments. It is different from other investment treaties and therefore cannot be easily compared but needs to be interpreted on its own. We furthermore say that this has been accepted in practice. We reviewed case law and is confirmed by Professor Schreier's testimony. If, if we now go into details, this is the wording of 26.7. We think it's undisputed between the parties that this expresses the will of the contracting parties to the Energy Charter Treaty that a company an investor which is not a natural person and which has the nationality of the contracting party to the dispute should be able to see it go to exit arbitration. This is an agreement, what you have. Article 26.7 is an agreement on nationality for the purposes of the exit convention. This only makes sense to have that if you want such a company to go to arbitration. And I think respondent seems to agree on that interpretation because they speak that it only grants procedural standing but no substantive rights. We think, however, that even that is not entirely correct if you consider what 26.7 is. Just if you take the literal wording, then it is only an agreement on nationality. But for a domestically incorporated company, to initiate exit arbitration, you need two elements. You need an arbitration agreement, i.e. consent within the sense of 25, 
and an agreement on nationality. 26.7, pursuant to its plain wording, would only give you an agreement on nationality. If that's all, then it doesn't make sense. If you only have an agreement on nationality, but not an arbitration agreement, then a domestically incorporated company cannot institute exit arbitration. The will of the parties clearly seems to be that they should be able to do that. There's an agreement that a domestically incorporated company is to be treated as a national of another contracting state, but you still need an arbitration agreement, and that is why you think the context is relevant. The arbitration agreement is in the ECT. Article 26.7 is, if you imagine a letter, is at the bottom of the ladder of the Energy Charter Treaty. It starts at 26.1. And 26.1 is always called the gateway to Energy Charter Treaty arbitration. It says there must be dispute between a contracting party and an investor of another contracting party. And then 26.2c says that only such disputes can be submitted to arbitration in accordance with the following paragraphs. So if you have a dispute which doesn't pass the gateway of 26, 1 and 2, you'll never end up in 7. And 7 is an agreement on nationality, according to its wording only. This doesn't make sense. You must have 26, 7 must be considered as an agreement also on the nationality pursuant to the Energy Charter Treaty, else you have just a, a rump provision which doesn't work. So you're basically faced members of the tribunal with two options how to interpret Article 26.7. Either you're saying the signatory states for three years negotiated a treaty and entered an a provision in there which is not operable. An agreement on nationality alone will not work without an arbitration agreement and the arbitration agreement requires that there's investor of another contracting party. Or you conclude that what Professor Schroyer has explained in his testimony, that 26.7 <coughs> merely reflects and has been tailored to reflect the language of the exit convention to make sure this is an, there's no problems when, <coughs> when it comes, when, when such a dispute is, is submitted to exit. He specifically explained, um, I need, wait a second. Yes, um, you see on the screen his testimony on page 1622 of the transcript where he says, I think the meaning of the textual change, and then he discusses respondent's interpretation, is that the final text was adjusted to the terminology of the exit convention. And he specifically points out that the Energy Charter Treaty puts the wordings of another contracting state in brackets um, and hyphen, meaning that it is a definition. So in short, 26.7, Oops. according to its wording, only is an agreement on nationality and wouldn't make any sense. If it is going to make sense, it must be an agreement also on nationality for the purposes of the ECT. Without that, you'll never end up at paragraph seven. You have to start at paragraph one, and paragraph one requires this. We say this is fully compatible with the object and purpose of the Energy Charter Treaty, at least the purpose of the Energy Charter Treaty does not conflict with such interpretation because, <coughs> as you know, the purpose is to create a special regime for uh, the energy sector. And what I, I've put you know, on the screen is an understanding which the, contra the contracting parties reached at the, final, um, uh, at the end of final session of the Energy Charter Conference. They say, we, the representatives underline that the provisions of the treaty have been agreed upon bearing in mind the specific nature of the treaty, aiming at a legal framework to promote long-term cooperation. And then they say it cannot be construed to constitute a precedent in the context of other negotiations. In plain words, they say we have done something special and what we've agreed upon here cannot mean that this can, can it be easily copied into other agreements. And that means giving locally incorporated companies the right to go to exit arbitration and considering the other contracting party is in line with the object and purpose. At least it's not contradicted by this. The travaux preparatoire to which respondent has referred 
we consider with all due respect to be not relevant for your view. The travaux preparatoires are, well, they're not entirely a mess, but this was a treaty negotiated with four, 54 parties. And what one s signatory and later contracting party said at a certain amount in time, that this reflected the joint will of all the other signatories and contracting parties. Well, respondent pleads speculation, but not causality. To, to, to prove this, you would have to have a far more convincing chain of document to show there was, for example, I think a legal advisory council or task force to the, in, during the negotiations. You would have to show that this document was discussed, that the parties adopted it. It isn't. They point to one document, they point to the final text with the same, with all due respect, with the same reasoning, I could say the sun rises up in the morning because I wake up. Both happens at the same time, but there's no causality. To establish causality is something entirely different. We have reviewed the list of energy charter treaty cases, and there's at least one case where also a locally incorporated subsidiary party claim, that is AES Summit, where the Sangari, where the Hungarian subsidiary Tisce Romo was the co claimant. And we've put you on the screen <coughs> an excerpt from the decision on jurisdiction, which is on record. And you'll see they do not even discuss the problems which we had discussed. They say, well, they shall be treated as a national of another contracting state for purpose of the exit convention, full stop. There's no discussion even whether it might, it might be able, uh, the 26-7 discussion which we have, they haven't even seen that. They've clearly, as Professor Shaw explained, considered it to be not a problem. It seems that all the other cases, and we've went through the whole list of, I think, 95 cases on the website of the Energy Charter Treaty Conference, there are no locally incorporated subsidiaries. So what we can say is there is no evidence to the country. To our best of our knowledge, there's no case where a local company sued and the tribunal said no. If there is one, well, then we might have overlooked it, but we're pretty sure we are safe on that. In conclusion, members of the tribunal, it is our view that 26.7 is a nationality agreement for both ICSID and the Energy Charter Treaty. If you were to follow respondents' interpretation that it is only, <coughs> that you only look at the plain wording only, then it has no scope of application. Then you have an agreement on nationality which never can take effect because you have no arbitration agreement which it needs in order to function. It's very, we believe it's sensible to approach, uh, to adopt the approach taken by Professor Christoph Schroyer that 26.7 merely was reformulated to be adapted to the language of the Exit Convention. And as regards respondents' argument that 26.7 and 25.2b were designed for state contracts, this makes no sense. The Energy Charter Treaty is limited to breaches of the treaty. You cannot submit contract breaches directly to the treaty unless you focus it on an umbrella clause. One last point, that question has been raised, put to us by you among the list of questions. Yes, we say the difference, there will be a difference of whether a dispute is submitted to exit or to Stockholm or to UNCTRA arbitration. But that is the nature of the rules. Even without the Energy Charter Treaty, under exit, a locally incorporated company could file a claim. That is the specific nature of the exit regulations and the negotiating states to the Energy Charter Treaty Conference took this into account and put a respective provision in it. Why they did not put a general provision for the other two options in there, well, we do not know. Perhaps they wanted to restrict it to exit because only exit has this possibility. But we agree there's no doubt there's a difference in case of an SCC arbitration or anti-trial only Vattenfall AB could claim. And while Vattenfall AB can rely on all investments even indirectly owned and controlled, that would be limited then to the percentage of its shares. But that is what is in the treaty. It all may be so, but by some magic, if you come to claimants four and five, especially five, 
suddenly the amount of damages that can be claimed is 50% higher, at least according to your submission. Is that correct? 100%. Yeah, no, yeah, 100%, actually 100% higher, <laughs> you're right. If criminal OHD is a claimant in its own right, and we say the energy charter treaty gives that possibility, then it can claim its damages. And those damages are higher than if only Vattenfall Nuclear would claim for its share. That is correct. But mm -hmm. we believe, and that is the kind of the next slide, we believe there is no middle way. Either you accept them to be claimants in their own right, and because they are controlled, and then th we say they're entitled to 100% of their damages, or only Vattenfall can only, or the Vattenfall companies can only claim for their share. Because if you were to do what respondents suggests, to limit the amount of damages which the power plant operating companies can claim, then the, the upper level Vattenfall nuclear, th then you would never compensate them for their part of the damage. Because if you pay 50% only of, of, if you pay only 50 euros out of 100 <coughs> to a company, which has other shareholders, then only 25 would be channeled upwards. But th that is the treaty. The parties, we, we say that is what the contracting parties agreed. The wording says they can go to arbitration. It makes no sense. We say that's the will of the parties. But please for first explain uh, yeah. the, the, the first, uh, the, the special specific features here of this cost plus and the pass through of the OAG. Or, or, or gay, um, how that functions. Um, and maybe I come back then with my questions. Okay, thank you. Then, I guess that is only just for your review and, and discussion, the quote by Professor Schroyer, who confirms that KKK can claim for its own damages. Uh, and then I would like to briefly talk about the nuclear fuel tax which has, again, this morning become quite urgent in the news because it seems there are currently plans to renew it by some parties. Why do you have jurisdiction over the nuclear fuel tax? We say they do not fall under Article 21 ECT. They are not excluded from your jurisdiction. And in any event, even if we were to find or were to consider that 21.1 applies, then we say claimant can rely on the uh, most favored nation clause. What we've submitted to you with regard to the nuclear fuel tax is essentially a claim for breach of a promise. Germany promised in the atom consent not to take <coughs> unilateral measures which are discriminatory with regard to taxation. We say that the Energy Charter Treaty makes this, the obligations under the Atom Consents to be binding. The Atom Consents itself is binding. And what we submit to you is a breach of Germany's voluntarily undertaken obligations. And that is different from what 21.1 says. We do not challenge the nuclear fuel tax per se. If there were no Atom Consents, there very likely wouldn't be a claim. It is the promise not to do that, what Germany did, which forms the basis. The taxation measure, the so-called taxation measure, is only a factual element of a claim, but it is not as such the, the thing which we complain about. It's the breach of the promise. But couldn't you say, in any case, uh, we're not complaining about the tax we're complaining about the unfairness and the inequitableness of the tax. So we're always entitled to bring a, mm -hmm. a claim under an FET provision uh, in respect of tax measures. Um, but that's background to the, the, the precise question, uh, which is what would the parties to the ECT have had to have said in Article 21.1 in order to exclude circumstances of this kind? from ECT claims, and how would the language have differed if they had intended to exclude this claim that you have? Professor Lowe, that is a 
fascinating question. <coughs> I must admit that at least and yesterday I have not given that much thought because what we were concerned with w was the language as it is. But if you allow us, can we come back to that in our posturing briefs? I think to give you now on the fly uh, an interpretation of how a treaty should look like in an issue which is so disputed would not be serious, could be taken serious from me. Well, to be clear, and 21.1 uh, says that nothing in this treaty shall create rights or impose obligations with respect to taxation measures. Now, mm -hmm. uh, on one view, which is the respondent's view, that formulation is so wide as to capture the kind of argument that you've made out. So uh, I suppose another way of asking the question I'm, I'm putting to you is mm -hmm. why should we not read the words with respect to taxation measures uh, as covering uh, this claim that you're raising here? Professor Lowe, <coughs> I think the basic point is already in the language of Article 21.1. We say it's not the treaty itself which created rights or obligations with respect to taxation measures, it's the atom consents. It's not that we, that we use a general norm like fair and equitable treatment and apply it to a specific tax and say, well, this tax is us 90%, that is unfair. We say that Germany undertook obligations in the atom consents outside the Energy Charter Treaty, and all that the Energy Charter Treaty does is to say, well, you have to <laughs> honor your obligations. But whether that obligation relates to tax measures or to something else is outside the Energy Charter Treaty itself. It all boils down to a very simple question. If you assume a case that the atom consents is binding, just for the sake of argument, then Germany promised not to introduce discriminatory taxation. And is 21.1 meant to allow Germany a way out of this? This is, this is my last uh, point on this, and I'm trying to pin down precisely what your case is. Uh, it seems to me that there are two ways you could be arguing the point. One is to say that the uh, dispute over the nuclear t fuel tax in the way that you have raised it is not, quote, a dispute with respect to taxation measures. So that you, you simply say this isn't a dispute about tax measures at all. A second way of presenting the case is to say that uh, regardless of what that phrase may mean, on a proper interpretation, the, EC tree, uh, the ECT allows states to enter into binding commitments uh, with investors, which will always prevail over limitations, um, which there may be on jurisdiction under the ECT, because uh, the fact that the agreement has been made allows the uh, investor to raise the claim under the umbrella clause provision or something of this kind. So one approach is looking simply at the wording of 27.1 and saying this claim doesn't fall within it. The second approach is looking at the ECT more broadly and saying that states' uh, agreements will always be enforceable, no matter what the, the content of those agreements is. And it's that distinction that I'm trying to pin down. Professor Lowe, aren't those two kind of two sides of the same coin? Because if I were to follow the second, if, if just for the sake of argument, go down the second line, well, an argument could be made, if that was the will of the parties, why didn't they say so? There is, after all, an, 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 an exception for expropriation. But that is why we think it's relevant here that it's the atom consents which created the obligations. We think the exception to which I think you might refer is already inherent in the words, nothing in this treaty shall create rights and obligations. And we say, it's not the treaty, it's the atom consents which creates rights and obligations. All the treaty says is you have to assess pacta sunt servanda. You have to honor your obligations, full stop, regardless to what it refers. The treaty, there's no specific, there's here a specific promise by the state, and what 21.1 is to exclude that you take the more general obligations, unfair treatment, unreasonableness, 
I think somewhere, in, I think it was in the 41.5 submissions where Germany said this is to protect the fiscal sovereignty of the state. Well, yes, but you, can, you do not need to protect someone from something which is freely already limited. If the state has promised to do, say, no, we're not going to do that, then there's no need to protect him against doing that. Uh, <clears throat> again, yeah, against that is the uh, fact uh, that absent uh, Article 10.1 of the ECT, you wouldn't have a claim for FET or under the umbrella clause. Isn't that the argument the other way? Ten one, I believe, is the source. Yes, of but um, I think, as I understand your sentence, I would say yes. But uh, that is why we say, if you were to interpret Article twenty one one as being all encompassing, then there's the MFN argumentation, which we rely. Well, with respect to that, look at the sentence of uh, <laughs> second sentence of twenty one one. In the event of any inconsistency between this article and any other provision of the treaty, the article shall prevail to, this article shall prevail to the extent of the inconsistency. Uh, certainly the argument can be made that uh, going through the MFN clause to uh, defeat uh, the first sentence of paragraph one of article uh, 21 uh, is inconsistent with article 21.1. Judge Bra, um, the argument could be made, mm -hmm. but I would disagree. I, I, I would disagree for the following reason. If you take 21.1 as the starting point, mm -hmm. then it clearly says that any exception to this must be based in this article, in 21. And um, the inconsistency as such does not refer to, doesn't relate to 21.1. It doesn't say this, if there's any inconsistency between this paragraph and any other provision, but between this article and we say the way to MFN goes via the exceptions in 21. So if 21 already has, let's call it metaphorically, a way out, if it already foresees that and says MFN can apply, then there is no inconsistency because then 21 w already allows MFN to be applied. It cannot be inconsistent. It is a little bit like if I'm a bit except you, you use this as a starting point and then you have a renvoi into the other provisions of the treaty, but there can be no inconsistency as long as 21 allows you to go out of 21 into other provisions. And that is exactly what we say. We believe that 21.3 allows us to rely on 10.7 of the N on, on MFN. And if 21.3 allows that, then there cannot be any inconsistency. An inconsistency could only exist if we rely on a provision and if we cannot trace back the application of that provision to 21, but we can. 21, you start at 21, then you say, okay, this doesn't is but and any article, and then you go down the list of paragraphs and then you come to 21.3 and 21.3 says, you can rely on 10.7 as long, even with regard to taxation measures, as long as they do not concern income or capital or any of the exceptions. And we say this doesn't apply. And if you then look at the next screen, we've copied in the presentation given by respondent. And you see what they have underlined. And we ask you if you go through this chain of paragraphs, you start at 21.1, which says, except as otherwise provided in this article. And then you go to 21.3, and says, which says, Article 10.2 and 10.7 shall apply to taxation measures, except that it shouldn't apply to certain provisions in NIFTA 7. And now you see what respondent has underlined, and now you're seeing what they haven't underlined. 
and what is important when you read those provisions. Because these, it, it's, I think it's once been called by, um, uh, Article 21 has once been called a Russian matroshka, an exception and an exception and an exception, and it indeed is really complicated. But that's why it's the more necessary to read this very carefully, and you find that those exceptions to the exceptions always refer to tax provisions, and down there, in 27.1.A2, you see it must be any provision relating to taxes of any convention of our dividends of taxation or of any other international agreement. But it must be provision relating to taxes. And we do not argue that we want to import the provision relating to taxes. What we say, very plain and simple, is that Germany has concluded dozens of bilateral investment treaties with other states without any limitation on, on tax disputes. Disputes about tax measures can be arbitrated under most German, on, I think under nearly every German bilateral investment treaty. And we're relying on those unrestricted provisions on the umbrella clause and FET. And to import that, there is no limitation there, and that is the more favorable treatment to which we think we are owed. And if Germany then says, well, this subverts the ECT carefully negotiated balance. <laughs> well, that's the essence of MFN. The essence of MFN is you always have a treaty which is negotiated, and then you conclude a second treaty with a third party, which has some advantages, and then you can say, I want that advantage too. It will always upset the balance. If that were an argument, you can completely forget MFN in world trade law, in investment law, everywhere. It is the essence of MFN that you disturb a negotiated balance. So you have a leveling up. One treaty, next treaty, then you level it up. This simply is what it is. If you have no further questions on that, I'd I do. Okay. I do. Help me out because indeed uh, 21 uh, is a carve out and then have exceptions to exceptions. Uh, okay. See that. So if you, uh, the starting position is in the first paragraph. Isn't it? It's, it simply says nothing in this treaty shall re recreate rights or impose obligations with respect to taxation measures. Yes. And then it has a preface that says except as otherwise provided in the article. So the structure seems to be, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that you have to find the exceptions in 21. And I think you, st you said the same thing uh, just uh, 10 minutes ago. That is correct. So if you, you and yeah. yeah, sorry. And then you oh. go down and you and you relied on on on, on, uh, on paragraph three of Article Twenty One, uh, which refers to ten two, Article Ten, Paragraph Two, and, and seven. seven. Yes. And, and what you say then is, uh, well, here there is um, an exception that uh, they will not apply to the MFN obligations. But that refers then to the uh, to the taxation treaties, isn't it? Article 10, 7. Uh, 10, uh, 3A, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I meant 3. 10, 7 shall apply to taxation measures of the contracting parties. MFN applies to taxation measures. Then comes an exception other than those no. on income and capital. And no. we don't have income and capital. No. And then comes another exception, except that such provisions, MFN, shall not apply to a, impose MFN with respect to advantages accorded pursuant to tax provisions. We don't have that. So that exception to the exception doesn't apply. And B, any taxation measure aimed at assuring the effective collection of taxes. We don't have it. So those A and B are exceptions to the first sentence of 3. 3 says 107 shall apply to taxation measures, full stop. Then come two exceptions other than those on income and capital, doesn't apply. And then another exception, it shouldn't apply to A and B, and A and B also don't apply. So we end up with the statement, 10.7 applies to taxation measures. Right, and 10.7? And 10.7 is what the term taxation... Yeah, so uh, that's an MFN clause, isn't it? Um, no, I'm first in sorry, I'm first in twenty one seven. Ten seven is the MFN clause, yes. Yep. But you you also have the definition in on which respondent relied in in, in twenty one seven. 
And Sorry, but let's, let's first okay. let's take it st step by step. Okay. You are in, in 10.7, and you say that the, the MFN clause, and that refers us to other BITs, according to you. Wait. Where you say uh, there Germany has agreed to arbitrate taxation, uh, tax matters. Yes. And for that reason, that imports the arbitrability of tax matters in the present case. Yes. Um, what may we arbitrate then? Uh, because if, if I follow you on this ma matter, that the arbitration provisions of another <laughs> treaty can be imported into the ECT, you know that is a disputed mer uh, matter all already in itself. But assuming now that is the case, that uh, the arbitration provisions on tax come in this treaty. Mm. Okay. Thank you. That gives me the possibility to clarify a misunderstanding. Ah. We do not import an arbitration provision. The usual dispute settlement clause in a German BIT is very broad and doesn't make any mentioning to tax disputes. So the point is, if you look, at, and we have, I think we have explained, I thought we had explained that, that when you look at the German BIT, you see no exclusion of taxation disputes. There is only one very limited clause in many BITs saying that advantage in the MFN section, advantages accorded, which are accorded due to membership in a, I think, regional integration organization or something like that. It clearly refers to DC, mm -hmm. that that doesn't apply. But there is no exclusion, no article similar to 21. There is no clause on expropriation, there's no exclusion in the umbrella clause, nowhere. The German BIT simply do not contain anything. So you could know what we are relying on is the unlimited umbrella clause and unlimited FET. Either you say, and this can be seen, it's, it's a bit, we either import something which isn't there, or we import the unlimited clause. It's the better treatment. Uh, the effect which you have here is that 21 is an exception to the substantive provisions. And that exception is not present in the German BITs. So if you take Article 10, then you must read it, and the umbrella clause, you must read it in combination with Article 21, and then you say, okay, I have a limited, uh, I have a limited Article 10. If, if you were to uh, say that 21.1 applies, you would, then you read 21 into 10, and you say, well, 10 applies, save if it's a taxation measure. And what we are saying is, in the German BITs, you have no save for a taxation measure. You have an umbrella clause which applies unlimited. You have an, um, you have an um, legitimate ex fund equitable treatment which is unlimited. We do not include, import a jurisdictional clause. The jurisdictional clause in the mm -hmm. German BITs is broader. What we're including is the unlimited substantive protection of the German BITs. So what, what basically what you, what, you are, what you are saying is, look, uh, all fine about Article 21.1, but the exception is via uh, Article 10.7, the MFN. We come back to what the BITs uh, with other countries, uh, binding Germany, provide, and uh, according to you, that a number of them provide for arbit arbitration of taxation matters, and therefore, also, disputes under the uh, under the ECT can be uh, decided uh, as it, uh, when they relate to taxation matters. Mr. President, um, we have explained in our briefs the original purpose of mm. Article 21, which is to avoid that provisions from double taxation agreements are imported via the treaty. That an investor suddenly relies on one double taxation agreement in order to be treated differently because double taxation agreements are preeminently political and they are basically cut out. We are not discussing anything like that here. We think what we are discussing is not something the parties had anticipated when they negotiated Article 21. They wanted to cut out the possibility mm. that you import advantages under other taxation agreements and that you disturb the finally negotiated balance for taxation matters. But this is something different here. We do not rely on a double taxation agreement between Germany and Sweden. What we're saying is Germany has promised not to discriminate in the area of taxation in a specific agreement, and they have done so. They're, this is, in our view, poles apart. So yeah. Which provision of the ECT do you say is violated by the nuclear fuel tax? <coughs> Professor Lowe, um, it is our argumentation, firstly, that the 
nuclear fuel tax was introduced in breach of the atom consensus and therefore constitutes either a breach of the umbrella clause, depends on whether you consider it binding, or at least legitimate expectations that is fair and equitable treatment. So it's a breach of 10.1. So the obvious question is, uh, if you're saying that, why doesn't Article 21, Paragraph 3, refer to 10.1? And it says Article 10.2 and 10.7 apply to taxation mm -hmm. measures. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say that 10.1 does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> no, let him answer. Taxation measures. Yeah. Um, we are not really complaining about the taxation measure, but about the breach. But what we ask you to take into consideration is the Energy Charter Treaty has 47 contracting states. For many of them, there might not be, many of them might not have concluded any investment treaties, other investment treaties upon which can be relied. MFN always is dependent <coughs> on the specific party at issue. And um, there was no, the parties clearly wanted to give most favored nation treatment. They said so, and they say 10-7 applies. Then they have a couple of exceptions, which we say makes clear they intend not to give MFN with regard to taxation measures, advantages under, under double taxation agreements and similar contracts, but this is something entirely different. And so the question, why didn't they include this? because they wanted to have MFN, and MFN depends on the stated issue. What works for Germany might not work for Kazakhstan or might not work for France. It is always dependent on the stated issue. That's the very essence on MFN, which says we bind you to what you give others. That is entirely different from including a general exclusion or a, gen uh, a general application. They didn't want that. What they said is if you treat your neighbor that way, then you have to treat the stranger the same way. Okay. Have yes. I answered? No. I'm just scrolling up to um, 21.7. Yes. Um, hang on, I have to do this by scrolling um, I, for the sake of complete understanding on the part of the tribunal, you depending on Article 21. You're depending upon Article 21, Paragraph 7A, Small Roman 2, if I understood you. <coughs> so reading it um, as follows. For the purposes of this article, 21, the term taxation major includes any other international agreement or arrangement by which the contracting party is bound. Am I correct? Uh, and that refers to the BITs. Mm, we disagree. Oh, okay. Well, then, um, so we you're read depending only on the broad uh, MFN clause in the ECT. Judge mm. Brown, we read Article 217A2 just differently. We okay. say that, and we're mentioning that because we think the interpretation suggested to you by respondent is incorrect. The term taxation measures includes, says the chapeau of 217A, any provision relating to taxes of any convention for the avoidance of double taxation. We don't have that. And then comes an or of, and we think this or of relates to any provision relating to taxes because it says any provision relating to taxes okay. of or da 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 or of any other international agreement by which the contracting party is bound, and we do not okay. rely uh, on any okay. other provision. I misunderstood. Go ahead. Thank you. If, ju just to add, Judge Brower, if respondent were correct with its interpretation, then 
21782 would relate to all agreements. And then MFN had no scope of application at all, and that doesn't make sense. So have I answered your questions? Because if so, I would then hand over to my colleagues who would speak about the issue of public perception in this case. Yes. Thank you very so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Tribunal. I will <coughs> now address the substance or aspects of the substance, substance of the case and start out with public perception and then move on to right to regulate and expropriation. But if we start with public perception, Germany confirmed in their opening statement on day one that the public perception of a nuclear energy in light of Fukushima accident was the trigger, indeed the only trigger, for the legislature to revisit the risks of nuclear energy protection, prote production and ultimately impose the moratorium and the 13th Amendment. Germany argues that the Fukushima accident made it conceivable that, and I quote, fundamental errors relating to the implementation and use of a technology with hazardous risks such as nuclear energy could occur in a democratic, high technological country like Japan in the 21st century. This is from the counter memorial, paragraph 249. Uh, besides the fallacy of classifying Japan's nuclear energy market as high technology, a view which is shared by nuclear experts today, Germany stated in its opening statement that the Fukushima accident was a beyond design event, quote unquote. The Reactor Safety Commission needed, it was suggested, to check the robustness of the plants beyond design. We're still unsure if Germany is of the view <coughs> that the risk, quote unquote, relates to the use and implementation of nuclear energy uh, and its technology or whether it relates to beyond design events. Was it the plants, the earthquake, or as we heard in Germany's opening, the wind? We also heard about new risks, which are not new because they are old. On this point, Germany, on the one hand, allegedly wanted to, quote, protect the health of its people as mandated by the German constitution, unquote. But on the other hand, it conceded that it is not a new risk because it's an old risk, meaning the residual risk of the production of nuclear energy. Well, if it was an old risk, then that begs the question why the measures implemented through the 13th Amendment were not taken earlier. For example, in connection with the Chernobyl accident, which occurred in 1986, in relative close proximity to Germany rather than in faraway Japan. In the opening statement, we also heard about black swans, dinosaurs, and meteors. Fairy tales and analogous aside, Germany admits to have admitted, uh, sorry, to have appreciated the sensitive nature of nuclear energy already in 1978. Yet it cannot explain how an outlier event, an event which Dr. Grauf confirmed as one in a million years, now should constitute a new old risk, causing a moratorium of all nuclear power in Germany. As Mr. Rangwald explained during our opening, the 13th Amendment was motivated by politics. There was no justifiable reason to shut down the claimant's nuclear power plants. The plants were safe, that is undisputed. The decision to shut down the plants were based on respondents' perception of the public's perception. That is also undisputed. Instead of making a proper analysis and ensuring that the interests of the power plant operators were properly considered and protected, respondents essentially decided overnight to close down nuclear power plants. The evidence of a decision driven by nothing but party politics and upcoming elections, we say, is overwhelming and has to a very large extent not been refuted by respondents in this proceeding. Other countries took a different and much more considered approach after Fukushima. Although certain stress tests and safety measures were put in place, no country, apart from Japan of course, decided to shut down power plants after Fukushima. Can, can I ask you a question for clarification here? It's a question of getting my, my focus on your argument right. And you say that Germany decided overnight to shut down nuclear power plants. But was that not a... And the, there's two questions. One is, was that not a policy that is declared at the opening of the atom concepts? Uh, 
the decision that was taken was not so much a decision to shut down the power plants, but as to the manner uh, in which that would be done. Uh, and the second point is, and, and is it your argument that uh, Germany must provide a safety justification for it and has no legal right to change its policy and that, the, that a change of policy would have been unlawful under international law? Uh, to start with the last question, I mean, and I will come on to this, we are not disputing uh, Germany's right to regulate and thus change policies. Uh, but as we've said, uh, it is responsible for the con consequences of such policy changes. And as you indicated, it, it actually relates to the way, the manner in which policy changes are implemented. So uh, I think that is uh, what we're saying. Well, and that, that just takes us to the question, where is the, the limitation under international law which we say is violated? And why should Germany not change its policy under international law? seems to me that the, 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 uh, your case is uh, that it comes down to the atom consents and that Germany is bound by virtue of the atom consents not to take certain steps so that we're in the area of interpreting that instrument. And is, is that right? Well, it's not only based on the atom consents. It's also based on the fact that, as we've said, even though a state has the right to regulate, there are limits to that right to regulate. And those limits are, in this case, imposed by the Energy Charter Treaty. And we'll get into the, uh, the provisions on expropriation, fair and equitable treatment, and so on and so forth. And the reason why we're now discussing public perception, obviously, is that uh, that is what has been suggested from the respondent side as the reason for uh, taking these decisions. And what we're saying, in essence, is uh, that is not good enough. That is not a justification under international law. It's that last step. I can see why the manner in which it's implemented would engage fair and equitable treatment, expropriation, and so on. But that doesn't go to the question of the motivation for the change. And I'm still not clear where, apart from the atom consents, you are saying that the ECT limits the right of a state to change its policy. Well, there is no explicit limitation to that effect, obviously, in the treaty, but it, it is, well, it is explicit in the sense that you have uh, provisions on uh, expropriation, fair and equitable treatment, and so on and so forth, Article 10 and Article 13 of the, those are the limitations. And so it's a limitation on the manner in which the change of policy is implemented and not uh, on the right to change the policy? Yes. I mean, we, right. have, we have never challenged the right to mm -hmm. regulate. So really, because if this is so, it seems to me that the discussion over the safety justification and public perception is not actually material to your case. Well, uh, we are addressing it because uh, that has been the suggested reason for, from, from the respondent side to take these measures. That's why it is uh, something we think we should address. Uh, so if, if um, I may continue that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, the political campaign against claimants' nuclear power plants came to a large extent from, from Schleswig-Holstein. Claimants' nuclear power plants were politically sensitive for the authorities and politicians in Schleswig-Holstein, which now seized on the opportunity to get rid of the plants before the elections in Schleswig-Holstein scheduled for March 2012, only months after the planned restart date of Krümmel in January 2012. Regardless of the validity of the public perception at play, this ultimately begs the question, uh, as you put, Mr. Chairman, uh, on the first day, how do we place legally public perception within the context of investment protection? Germany has not addressed this question, and trying to answer it, has its, its attempts has led to general invocations of a state's right to regulate the right, as I just said, which we have never disputed. Um, Germany has suggested that a state is able to do what it wants, but that the extent to which it implements such a decision cannot violate international law. This again is day one from the transcript, page 255, 
and 256, lines 9 to 10 and 13 to 4, 4, 15. We do not disagree, as I said, uh, provided that the state pays appropriate uh, compensation. Yet the answer to, to the chairman's question is, as we submit, it plays no role at all under international law, not as a defense nor as an excuse under the ECT. There is no place for public perception in international law. It has no role to play. It has no role to play. It is, of course, not to be confused with public interest in the context of lawful expropriation. This is a different concept, as, as you know. There is no right, no standard, no exception, no common practice related to public perception under customer international law, nor under the ECT. In our case, we are talking about public perception as perceived by certain politicians. Elections were coming up. The government wanted to secure the elections. It was believed that they could do so by introducing the moratorium and the measures. They wanted to please the voters. Maybe this is realpolitik, but neither realpolitik nor public perception can constitute excuses under international law. Uh, if I may then move on to the right to regulate. As I've said, uh, as we've said several times, we don't, do not question Germany's right to regulate. However, uh, you cannot, the tribunal cannot accept a broad brush approach to this international law principle to find that respondents' actions were merely an exercise of its rights under international law to protect its citizenry. Rather, it's a basic understanding of this international law principle that while the sovereign state does have the inherent right to regulate. Uh, the exercise of such right is not limited, is not unlimited, and must have its boundaries. And uh, as I just said, one such boundary is uh, international treaties, in fact the rule of law, which includes treaty obligations. So therefore when Germany entered into the Investment Protection Treaty, uh, the ECT, it became bind by, bound by it, obviously. Uh, the investment protection obligations it undertook uh, must be honored uh, and cannot be ignored by a later argument of its, of its right to regulate. Uh, Professor Dolzer, in his opinions, um, has referred to uh, jurisprudence on this point, um, and he says the following that the ultimate purpose of a measure by the host state, desirable as it may be, will not shield the state from liability if the state's treatment of the investor is not in conformity with an investment agreement or a treaty obligation. Germany has suggested that the ECT is a carefully negotiated balance between the investor and the state. Although this is true in principle, it must be recalled that investment treaty are deliberately drafted by the contracting parties in a one-sided manner, i.e. in favor of protecting investors and investments. And that is done to improve the investment climate in the host state with a view of encouraging foreign investment uh, by granting additional uh, protection to the investor above and beyond the rules of customary international law. Uh, this one-sided character of investment protection treaties is relevant when interpreting it. Based on the Vienna Convention, obviously, it goes to the object and purpose of the treaty. It is for the parties to the treaty to decide whether they deem it useful to enter into treaties which grant special protection to the foreign investor. At the time of a dispute, there is no need and indeed no legal basis for a tribunal to balance or more precisely to rebalance, as Professor Dolce put it, the mutual interests of both parties in a manner that is not expressed in the text of the agreement and that is not in conformity with the object and purpose of the treaty. Concerning expropriations, there is no exemption under customer international law for a state's obligation from paying compensation to the dispossessed investor. In fact, is, it is a well-known, well-recognized rule in international law that the property of aliens cannot be taken whether for public purposes or not, without compensation. The obligation to pay compensation pursuant 
to a direct expropriation can only potentially be avoided in highly exceptional circumstances where the expropriatory act was necessary to, p to protect the public against an immediate danger, such as to prevent a pandemic. This is a highly unusual exception, rather than a relevant distinction between compensable and non-compensable takings. It is also not relevant in this arbitration, since German has never alleged that it withdrew claimants' NEPVs and operating licenses to protect the public from any immediate danger. Instead, it is undisputed that claimants' plans are safe. When we focus on indirect expropriation, there is no codified custom international law standard. In arbitral practice, different schools of thought have emerged to discern a state's liability for regulatory measures creating a certain degree of uncertainty um, in arbitral jurisprudence, that is. And this uncertainty has led tribunals to adopt the sole effects doctrine. This approach is reflected in the most commonly edited definition, uh, cited definitions of expropriation found in commentaries, arbitral jurisprudence, and draft conventions. Pursuant to this doctrine, the decisive factor is solely the effect of the governmental measure on the property owner. The purpose of the governmental measure is irrelevant in making that determination. The purpose of the measure, uh, as I said, is of no concern, only whether the economic impact is equivalent to that of a direct expropriation, i.e. amounts to total or near total deprivation of the investment. This conclusion uh, concerning the, this sole effects doctrine is notably uh, contrary to the recent Philip Morris case. Uh, rendered this year in, in, the, in July. As we know, the tribunal in that case reasoned that the claimant's claim for indirect expropriation must fail since the measure at hand was a valid exercise of the state's regulatory authority. The tribunal uh, took this conclusion one step further and found that, and I quote, the state's reasonable bona fide exercise of police powers in such matters, such matters as the maintenance of public order, health, and morality, excludes compensation, even when it causes economic damage to an investor, and that the measures taken for that purpose should not be considered expropriatory. We submit that the tribunal got it wrong for at least three reasons. First, even assuming that the Philip Morris Tribunal's restatement of the custom international law standard were accurate and relevant, which we say it, it is not, there was no legal basis for incorporating any custom international law exemption into the plain wording of the expropriation provision in Article 5.1 of that of the relevant uh, bit. In order to import such a general exception from custom international law, um, the, uh, that, that tribunal, the Philip Morris Tribunal, relies on the Vienna Convention, Article 31.3c. As we have explained in our responses to certain tribunal questions, the Vienna Convention, in our view, uh, cannot be used to create a rule or an exception as to what constitutes an expropriation under the bit. The Vienna Convention deals with interpretation of treaties, cannot serve as a basis for creating rights or exemptions. The treaty provision in, in the treaty interpretation context constitutes lex specialis. Uh, as stated by the tribunal in the ADC versus Hungary case, there is general authority for the view that the, the BIT can be considered as a lex specialis whose provisions will prevail over rules of customary international law. So that's the first reason uh, why we say that the Philip Morris Tribunal got it wrong. Secondly, uh, the Tribunal did not apply the sole effects doctrine and focused solely on the purpose of the measures. Uh, not only is this, in our view, contrary to arbitral practice, but as Gary Bourne stated in his dissent, 
margins of appreciation which was referred to by that tribunal are not relevant in investment arbitration, nor were they intended to be included by the drafters of the BIT in question. Thirdly, uh, the analysis of the Philip Morris Tribunal is not applicable to the present circumstances in this case. In Philip Morris, it was not in dispute that smoking cigarettes represents serious health risks. It was shown that cigarettes are a legal consumer product that is highly addictive and causes the deaths of up to half of the long-term consumers. These were undisputed facts in that case. Uruguay then went on to show that there was a domestic and international obligation that arose over a long period of time to eliminate smoking in Uruguay to protect the health of its citizens. Contrary to the uh, undisputed health risks of tobacco used in the Philip Morris case, uh, the parties in our case, in this case, agree that scientific reports and inspections confirm that claimants met the safety standards for nuclear power plants in Germany. Thus, even considering a general risk posed by nuclear energy, if that were to be accepted, this risk cannot be imputed to claimants' nuclear power plants in this case, which were safe, as we've said. Also, uh, with respect to the Philip Morris case, uh, our case is distingu distinguishable from that case. Uh, in that Germany uh, lack objective and scientific evidence that could justify the measures that Germany has taken. Whereas the Philip Morris Tribunal was able to refer to countless scientific and political reports, not only showing that there was an immediate and real harm caused by, by tobacco, uh, Germany has not provided a single <coughs> valid reason, scientific or otherwise, that could justify the shutdown or lifetime limitations of the nuclear power plant. In fact, Germany ignored several international reports and the report by its own Reactor Safety Commission, which confirmed that the nuclear power plants did not pose safety risks. The situation here rather concerns, uh, as some market observers have found, that Germany was a singular exception to the trend where countries, even after the Fukushima accident, pursued new plants or considered extending the lifetime of existing plants. In other words, whereas Uruguay spent decades phasing in restrictions on tobacco based on scientific findings, Germany spent days phasing out nuclear energy based solely on party politics. Um, that finishes my section on right to regulate, and I would now move on to expropriation, unless there are any questions from the tribunal. Um, when we talk about uh, expropriation in our case, we of course focus on Article 13.1 of the ECT. Um, which does include a distinction for regulatory measures enacted by the state that amount to expropriation uh, requiring compensation as such and those that do not. Uh, Article 13.1 of the ECT prescribes a specific, uh, sorry? And I said Article 13.1? You picked it up correctly. Right, okay. okay. That was counts. <laughs> uh, Article 13.1 of the ECT pre pre prescribes a specific criterion by which to determine uh, the distinction. Uh, and the criterion is this, that measures having effect equivalent to nationalization or expropriation. In other words, whether or not the measures have been taken for a public purpose does not form part of this test. So as we have mentioned, the decisive factor uh, in finding whether or not expropriation has occurred is the effect of the measure. This is again the sole effects doctrine. Uh, and in fact, in, in relation to tribunal question number nine, it seems that Germany agrees with this approach. 
um, in its reply uh, to your questions, uh, tribunal questions, Jovan has said that in the case at hand, there is no need for the respondent to invoke the police powers doctrine. Um, just to, to provide you with some references of case law of rendered awards which support uh, the sole effect doctrine, uh, let me mention a couple of cases. Santa Elena versus Costa Rica is one case, which is a in the file, obviously, Bywater, another case. Suez versus Argentina, Siemens versus, versus Argentina. These cases, uh, we say, all support the sole effect doctrine. Um, Professor Scheuer has also confirmed uh, this approach, uh, and in one of his uh, expert reports, he says the following. The fact that the measure is in the public interest and non-discriminatory cannot be the answer to the question whether an expropriation has occurred. An expropriation may take place under perfectly legitimate circumstances. Arbitrariness, bad faith, lack of proportionality, and other imp improprieties are not constitutive of elements of expropriation. Their absence does not mean that an expropriation could not have taken place. As I said, throughout the course of the proceedings, these proceedings, Germany seems to have confirmed this approach. In fact, the entirety of Germany's defense in relation to expropriation focuses on the effect of the 13th Amendment and whether or not claimants experienced any financial impact at all. So coming back to Article 13 uh, of the ECT, Um, as we have explained, uh, we submit that Germany has breached its obligations under Article 13 and under customer international law by directly and indirectly expropriating claimants' investments. Germany has done so by permanently revoking claimants' licenses to operate the Kremlin Brunsbüttel plants, revocation of licenses, licenses which in and of themselves constitute investments under the definition of the ECT. They've done so by revoking all of claimants' NEPVs for all plants. <coughs> and as Dr. Hupp explained, the production volumes also constitute investments under the ECT. <coughs> and they've done so by rendering claimants' old volumes, the old PVs, worthless. These measures took away all future income from claimants and left claimants, in fact, with significant liabilities for decommissioning. Claimants are now worse off than it would have been had Germany taken over title to the plants. So what was the effect of these measures uh, uh, on claimants' investments that uh, Germany has taken? Um, well, as I just said, uh, the licenses were withdrawn, uh, which obviously meant that the nuclear power plants could not operate any longer, uh, no income. As for the NEPVs, uh, these volumes were revoked in full from the nuclear power plants, uh, and this includes claimants' indirect ownership and control of the NEPVs, which relate to the Bruckdorf plant. Uh, that's those, also, those production volumes, production rights, also constitute an investment under the definition of the ECT because it's an asset, has economic value, it is controlled and or owned directly or indirectly by claimants. So it is an investment. As far as the old volumes are concerned, as we've explained, the 13th Amendment destroyed the possibility for claimants to sell any OPVs to third parties because the measures taken by, by the German government destroyed the market. The, yes? 
Just before you move on, can you explain how the revocation of the Crummel license to produce uh, is distinguished from the Crummel OEPVs? I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but uh, I mean the revocation of the licenses, uh, obviously, as I said, in and of itself is an expropriation. I mean, a license a uh, granted according to law, if you look in definition of the ECT, is an investment. So that investment was taken away, uh, and the uh, and the OPVs of, of the criminal, those are also uh, investments. So I'm, I'm maybe Dr. Hub wants to help out here. Professor Lowe, um, I think you find your answer in the draft to the 13th Amendment. Usually, before the 13th Amendment, the operator, the license to produce electricity, to be in power operation, would expire only once all OEPV would be exhausted under the 13th Amendment. <coughs> By law, the license, was, it was said, is extinguished. And specifically, however, this did not affect the OEPV. That is, I, I, that is what you aimed at. That is why the plant still has an OEPV. There's a statutory provision which says the expiry of the license to power operation does not affect the OEPV. <coughs> but it was by law taken away and then ensured that you can see st that still the OEPV remained despite the license being taken away. Th th that's exactly what's confusing me. And uh, the way I'm thinking of it is that the revocation of the Crummel license, uh, you could rephrase as saying they took away Crummel's right to produce electricity. That's when the, you know, when the uh, Crummel OEPV is rendered valueless, you could say they rendered valueless Crummel's right to produce electricity. So I'm asking what is the difference between those two things, or, or is, is there no difference? Are they just different ways of formulating the same point? There is a difference. With the, with the revocation of the license to power operation, you transformed a power plant which had that license into a building and scrap metal. It can't operate. You still have all the buildings, you have all the machines, you have the real estate, but you can't use it. It's worthless as a nuclear power plant. The volumes as such, in theory, can be transferred, but only in theory. That is why we explained that due to the hard shutdown dates, shutdown dates the market was destroyed. So you still have those volumes, but you can only transfer them to other power plants, and other power plants are not going to buy them. I mean, another, as we see it, uh, I mean, both the license and the <coughs> old volumes are investments mm -hmm. under, the, under the treaty. So as Dr. Hub said, even though you can't produce new electricity, you have the old <laughs> volumes that you can sell, and the idea was supposedly that they have a value, you can make money by selling them. But since the measures resulted in what it resulted, i.e. destruction of the market, couldn't be sold, no value, uh, as Mr. Kasmerk has explained. So I think that's, if we have understood your concern correctly, I think that's probably our explanation. Uh, could I explore that a little bit uh, further? Under um, Amendment 11, <coughs> um, it seems, but straighten me out if that's not right, that the agreement to which the um, power producers and the uh, government came <coughs> was to provide, at least to the satisfaction at that time of the power producers, um, enough opportunity to uh, operate into, into the future until you've exhausted your OEPVs. <laughs> and during that time to uh, reserve the further funds required for eventual decommissioning. Uh, have I got that right so far? Okay. Now, 
when uh, 13 came in, the case put by the uh, uh, respondent is uh, that the government designed 13 um, so that taking into account that uh, Kremlin was being shut down along with seven of the other plants. Nonetheless, uh, the uh, um, situation of the still operating plants uh, should have allowed um, Kormov and the other closed down plants uh, a, a sufficient uh, ability to uh, transfer their OEPs for value uh, for a value uh, that would have uh, permitted Kormel, as an example, despite not operating, to uh, wind up in the same financial position, uh, including for decommissioning, that it would have. Now, the testimony seems to be from the two sides as follows as regarding those OEPVs. The case put by um, Fattenwald is that, if I understand it, we corresponded with Aon, at least, in 2015, four years after the shutdown. Um, would you like to buy these? And they said, no, not at this time, but we might come back to you. Uh, and the case uh, put by the uh, respondent is these will have value, the amount not stated, in the future. So the reality is that at this point the tribunal has no evidence. Um, but I, I, let me just add one thing. I think that uh, Mr. Kaczmarek said uh, that they might have some value mm -hmm. uh, in the um, in, in the future. So what um, <coughs> what we are faced with is a contention on the part of Germany that we thought we we thought we gave you the equivalent. We, we thought we fulfilled your legitimate expectations, as it were. Um, by uh, all of the terms of Amendment 13. Um, it's difficult for us to assess the, uh, the extent to which those expectations were satisfied or not satisfied since nobody knows. Um, I, I know your cases, they have no value, um, but the overall evidence is um, on the one side, they might have some value, uh, or no, that they, uh, on the side of Germany, that they uh, will have value in the future, amount unstated, uh, and on your part, that four years after we uh, were shut down, we couldn't sell them to uh, Eon, but they seem potentially open in the um, uh, in the future. Now. Is it your case that uh, there was no way on God's green earth, as we sometimes say, that uh, Amendment 13 could have satisfied uh, what you feel your legitimate expectations or the commitment under the uh, umbrella clause? Or uh, I, I guess that's the basic uh, question, you, you, you do not accept that they did what should have fulfilled your expectations? Well, I, I think, I mean, uh, as, as we have explained, uh, in fact, uh, these old volumes did not have any value because there was no market for them. And I think there is agreement between the parties that as of 2011, 
uh, there, there, there was no market and thus no value of, of these volumes. Uh, we have agreed, and Mr. Kasmerick has accepted, so to speak, that there might be a value sometime in the future, but that is very, very uncertain. And as you said, uh, the claimants have tried to interest others in buying these volumes. No one is interested. But I think the uh, Mr. Ka our view and Mr. Kasmerick's view is that when the measures were introduced in March 2011, it was already then clear that there would be, would be no value to these volumes. Uh, and that, that was obvious, we say, to the government. They, they could have uh, sort of made investigations, calculations, and so on and so forth at that time to find that out, but they didn't do that kind of work. Um, so already at that point, we say it was clear, should have been clear to the government that these were actually worthless. I think that's our answer to your question as I understand it. Can, can I go back to explain this? Um, what is the evidence on which you base your contention that when the 13th Amendment was enacted, that the OEPVs would be worthless? Um, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the OEPVs were also un already existing <coughs> when the Kumo plant was functioning, operating. And um, what the 13th Amendment did was, you, those OEPVs, you may no longer produce with the Kumo plant, but you can sell them to somebody else. Uh, now, in that perspective, when they enacted this, what is the evidence then that the OPVs of that moment had become worthless in the sense that somebody else could produce electricity? Well, uh, what the evidence is, uh, I don't know if I can answer that right now, but I think the fact that they uh, put shut, fixed shutdown dates on all other plants created a market situation which mm, uh, would have made it possible, I think, for the government to figure out that they would not have any value, did not have any value. <laughs> but I mean, I have to consult with colleagues if, if there is any evidence, as you put it, to that effect. Okay, but may, may then this uh, suggest that we have a break at this point in time, because there are now two hours going on. And I was actually... Uh, I had finished my section on expropriation, so Sorry. that's... You I had. Oh, you already had yeah, so I'm done. Oh, so but there's still one question by Professor Law okay. on this question, so that we can yeah. hold off. And then during the break, you may look into this question about the evidence. It, it's not a question, it's just a comment. Um, uh, as, as I read the uh, respondent submission in paragraph 274 of the counter memorial, 273 of the rejoinder, uh, their case is that the government did, in fact, work out uh, carefully, as they say, that the OEPVs could be utilized within a certain frame and that the phase-out was designed specifically to have that purpose of uh, retaining the value of the OEPVs. And that's the, the sort of background against which this question comes up. Different question? Different question? Okay. Um, I realize you were talking about expropriation, um, but I'm, um, and this, but this relates more to um, FTE or the um, um, umbrella clause. Is it part of your case that um, it was wrong of the Federal Republic of Germany not to have consulted with the power companies at the time it was considering shutting down those plants in order to work out whether um, the potential 13 uh, could in fact w be designed to fulfill your expectations under the atom consensus? I think Judge Breyer that the short answer is yes. 
Okay. Uh, and I think we have, uh, and I think Mr. Anderson will cover this in his FAT presentation. <laughs> yeah. okay. Recess until uh, 10 to 11. <laughs>